My name is Jim Fleming, and this is Our Sunday School. Our Sunday School is part of Stewart Heights Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. To prepare for this lesson, please go to OurSundaySchool.com for a copy of today's handout. Now, let's get to this week's lesson. Well, good morning, and welcome to Our Sunday School. I'm glad you're able to join us this morning. If you got your Bibles, we're in Mark chapter 11, and uh, we'll be jumping around in lots of different places in the entire Bible today. So I would encourage you to have a, a complete copy of God's Word, uh, as well as if you want to head over to OurSundaySchool.com, uh, you can grab a copy of our handout. I uh, would recommend you do that as well. Lots of uh, different concepts that we'll be looking at today. And uh, first things first, just let me say uh, welcome and uh, I am glad to be back teaching this week. Last week was nice to have a week off, and I hope you got to celebrate the risen Lord with uh, your friends and family, and uh, appreciate uh, your all's flexibility with us as we just continue to adapt and adjust because of uh, the days of COVID. I heard it referenced that way a couple of weeks ago on a podcast that I listened to, and I thought that was a pretty good phrase. So. Uh, welcome to those of you that are with us this morning. So I see uh, the heirs are here, uh, the Velosins. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm on pollen overload as well, Jen. I, I, I don't know if you can hear it, but you, you probably see it, the, the eyes and the, the voice and the throat, and it's all just kind of um, welcome to April in the South, right? And uh, Miss Nancy Miller, hey, good morning. So uh, like we do each week, we'll start with uh, our question, what is God doing in you through his word from the portion of Mark we've studied so far? Uh, so if you've got uh, an answer to that, I would love for you to share that with us. You can either do that uh, live this morning or you can send me a text or Facebook or email about that. I'd love to hear what God is doing in your life there. It's always uh, encouraging to see how the Spirit moves on a regular basis in our lives, uh, that God has not left us alone. He's given us His Word, He's given us His Spirit, and He's given us a hope of an empty tomb and a future resurrection that uh, we can look forward to. So good morning also to uh, Cheryl Benefield. Hey, good morning, Cheryl. Uh, then uh, the archers are here. Fantastic. Good, good, good. Boy, aren't we glad we got that boy a job. I'm telling you what, I'm thrilled about this. So I'm just excited beyond belief about that, Tim. So, uh, all right, so we're in Mark chapter 11 today. Uh, so we'll read through all of Mark chapter 11, uh, and then we'll start, Lord willing, in a few minutes with verse 15. Uh, I think this is a one-week handout, but it may not be. If you guys have lots of questions this morning, we may slow down a little bit and uh, push it into two weeks, but I, th I think it'll be a one-week handout. We'll see. All right, so uh, if you got your Bibles, let's go to Mark chapter 11, and uh, let's read God's Word. <clears throat> Mark 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks in the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest! And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And on the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and who bought in the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. 
And when evening came, they went out of the city. And they passed by in the morning, and they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, who also is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. I love Jesus. <laughs> Such a beautiful illustration of uh, God's care and compassion and concern for those who desire to worship him. So I'll talk this morning a bit out of order around my t-shirt first. So those of you uh, that pay attention to sports, it is now uh, baseball season. And I was hoping to see... Let's see who else is here. Hey, the, the Arnolds are here this morning. Chandelier's here this morning. Good morning. The Greggs are here from North Carolina. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, and I was hoping to see my friend uh, Mitch Johnson on this morning. He's probably on. He probably just hadn't commented yet or I've missed it. Uh, because he loves this t-shirt. Because he is a raving fan of the New York Yankees and of the Boston Red Sox. And what this t-shirt has done is... Uh, traffic was terrible coming down the stairs. That's awesome. Barry. Good morning, Barry. Uh, and what this t-shirt has done is it has intermixed both of those teams. So it's the words of the Yankees in the font of the Red Sox. And there is basically nobody that is either a Yankees fan or a Red Sox fan or a baseball fan in general who likes this t-shirt. Because you're expecting something and you don't get it. And for a lot of people, Mark chapter 11 is the chapter of the New Testament where you expect one type of Jesus and you get a different type of Jesus. And I would propose that when we get something different from God than what we expect, it is not because we have a proper understanding of God. It is because we have an improper understanding of God. So this morning, what I want to do is put some color in context and uh, a little bit of geography. We'll do a lot more geography in the coming weeks. Uh, I'm hoping I can have some friends help me out with this. And uh, a little bit of uh, uh, layout and cultural background to help us understand what Jesus was actually doing and who it impacted and who it really didn't impact. So we'll, we'll talk through those things as we kind of move through the lesson today. But just as a reminder, uh, if you look at Mark chapter 11 as a whole, Mark does this sandwich thing again, which he's been doing all through his gospel. So in the beginning of chapter 11, he talks about, you know, with the enter Jerusalem in 1 through uh, 11. Uh, then there's the cursing of the fig tree. Then there's the cleansing of the temple. We come back to the fig tree. Then we come back to those who saw him do what he did in the temple. So the, the fig tree uh, bookends this experience that we read about this morning in 15 through 19 in Mark's gospel. So let's take a look at a couple of things. If you've got your handout, let's jump right in. Uh, so verse 15, uh, and they, so these are Jesus and his disciples, came to Jerusalem. Now this was the time for the Passover. We've talked about this a couple of times so far that all of Mark's gospel is leading up to what happens in this week. This is the Holy Week. This is the week that Jesus will be sacrificed for our sins, that he will die, that he will uh, be buried, that he will rise again. Uh, so really, all of Mark chapter 11 through 16 happens in a week. It, it, it is a fast and furious pace in Mark's gospel at this point. So they come to Jerusalem. 
and he entered the temple. Now, I, I am not a temple scholar. Uh, I don't want to be a temple scholar. It is not my passion. I have other passions. Uh, I'm working on one of them right now. It is frustrating the devil out of me. And, uh, and I'm hopeful to have a really cool tool to share in a couple of weeks. But, um, but I, the, the temple is not my forte. So when I have questions about things that I don't understand, I go to resources that help me understand a little bit about what's going on. So I found a couple of good resources online. I want to show you some pictures. Now, this is uh, Herod's temple, what we're looking at right now. And this is not the same as the temple that Solomon built. This is something that was uh, vastly expanded off of what Solomon built. Same place, uh, but, uh, but this is something that's uh, shockingly larger. So a, a couple of things about this, uh, this layout. And you can almost think about the temple as a complex of different buildings. Um, there's a massive wall around uh, the base of the thing. Uh, and if you look in the, the lower right-hand corner there, you'll see the size comparison. And this is just an approximation of you know, how, how big this thing was. But the dark box on the right is a football field. So this is, this is not a small space that Jesus comes into. This is a massive, massive complex of buildings and walls and entries and just a spectacular amount of rules and regulations. If you can read the text on the screen, you'll look at the, the biggest chunk of the space. And really, the, the whole temple complex took up about 35 acres. It's a big place. And the, the biggest chunk of this space is dedicated to the court of the Gentiles. And basically, this is where uh, Jews and Gentiles could both go, and uh, you could be safe there. And uh, that was not the case for all the spots in the temple complex. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take that very center rectangle where the building with the gold top on it uh, is. And we're going to blow that up and we're going to look at uh, kind of a cutout of just that very smaller piece. So this is the, um, you know, the inner courts, if you will, of Herod's temple. It's called Herod's temple because Herod built it up. Uh, to be substantially larger than it was prior to Herod's rule. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week uh, in the week after. But uh, you see on the right-hand side, on the far right-hand side, the Gentiles' courtyard, the bottom side, the Gentiles' courtyard, that's representative of this larger space that's the massive portion of the temple. So back at this smaller cutout, you see on the, you, you see there's the bigger rectangle and you kind of got the square shape on the right and then another square shape on the left. The, the right section is the women's courtyard. Uh, so Jewish women, not Gentile women, Jewish women were allowed to enter there. And on the left, uh, this would be where the priests were allowed to go. So Jewish men and women were allowed to enter into the women's courtyard. Only Jewish priests were allowed to enter into the priestly courtyard. And then into the holy place itself, this was reserved for the high priest. So if you think about the way this thing is built, the outside edge was open to anybody. The inside piece was open to Jews. The smallest, the smaller piece was open to Jewish priests, and the smallest piece was open to the high priest. So it got uh, progressively more selective and restrictive as you went through. Um, Josephus says that there was a sign on the outside of the women's courts that basically said, uh, Gentiles enter at risk of your life. The idea there was you, you, this place was not for you. You have a place. It's the Gentiles courtyard. And there were lots of things that happened in the Gentiles courtyard. We'll talk about that. Um, but I just wanted to have you give you a perspective of how big, um, how big this was. So great question, Jen. Why would the Gentiles go to the temple? Uh, why did anybody go to the temple? To offer sacrifices. Um, that's why you would go to the temple. <laughs> uh, Gentiles could be... Uh, could be offering sacrifices as well. Uh, they would also come to look and see what was going on and to kind of get close to uh, the, you know, quote unquote action, if you will. Uh, but there would be lots of reasons that you could go, but offering sacrifices would be one. So back in verse 15, they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those. Uh, and the word drive out is, a, is one of my favorite words in Mark. It's ekbalo. Uh, it's the same word that Mark uses to describe Jesus ejecting or casting out demons out of 
basically every single person that he cast a demon out of in Mark's gospel. So there's this idea of what he was doing earlier in Mark is consistent with what he is doing here. It just has a much more direct and obvious religious flavor to it than uh, ekbaloing a, um, a demon out of someone, excising someone. Mm -hmm. So we began to drive out those who sold. We'll talk about that. And this is a present active participle. So this is, their, this is the habit of selling. These are people whose this was their job was to sell. And those who bought, again, a present active participle. This is the, the people who, this is what they typically did. So there were people that regularly bought. There were people who regularly sold. Um, and and I, if you want a couple of examples of what Jesus is not doing, Jesus is not saying all buying and selling, all commerce, if you will, is bad. Uh, Mark 10, 21 is a place where selling is described as a good thing. This is where Jesus tells the uh, the rich young man to go and sell what he has, right? So sell, some selling is a good thing. Uh, and then later on in Mark's gospel, in Mark 15, 46, and in 16, 1, uh, we see buying can be a good thing when you go and you buy and you use resources for something righteous. So uh, these, are, th these are not exclusive because there's going to be some people that look at this text and say, well, Jesus is against uh, capitalism or Jesus is against... Uh, e uh, economics, if you, even in a broader sense. And that's really not what he's saying here. That would be going substantially too far. Um, what Jesus is against is going to be made very, very clear. Jesus is against restricting worship. Jesus is against the misuse of religious things. Jesus is against taking what God the Father declared to be true and behaving as if it wasn't. That is what Jesus is demonstrating his opposition to here in a very clear way. So those who sold and those who bought uh, in the temple. So we, when you say in the temple, I want to make sure what we, we understand what we're talking about. We're not talking about inside the court of the Jews, inside the court of the women. We are talking about in the Gentiles courtyard, in this massive open space. That's the spot that we're talking about. Uh, and anybody reading Mark's gospel in the first century would have known, well, of course, that's what we know what we're talking about. And we, as you know, 21st century Christians, look at this and go, I don't know, I would like to have some resources to help me out and understand this a little bit. And thank God we've got scholars and biblical archaeologists who can go and uh, help us understand what was going on. And quite frankly, a big chunk of this stuff is still here, right? So the, the places where these things existed still exist. Um, so those who bought and sold in the temple. And so then we get to the next uh, section here. Uh, so he's in there. And what does he do? So he overturns the tables. And if you look at the Greek word for overturned, uh, it means to turn upside down or to upset. But the Greek word itself is katastrefo. Uh, and if you were to just sound it out, if you didn't know Greek, it looks like catastrophe because that's what it is. It's the basis for our English word catastrophe. Uh, and Jesus basically wreaks a catastrophe on these people who are <clears throat> buying and selling inside the temple. So he overturned, he, he catastrophied the tables of the money changers uh, and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And you might be thinking, the money changers? Like, what is, what's going on with that? I mean, what... Why do we need money changers? All right, so let's let's back up a second. So let's let's talk about our cultural context, and then we'll try to segue, probably not very artfully, into the historical cultural context. So we use dollars in the United States, U.S. dollars. That's our currency. If you want to go buy or sell something in the United States, you use dollars. If you want to go to Canada, I have some relatives that live in Canada. If you want to go to Canada, U.S. dollars don't work everywhere in Canada. Matter of fact, they don't work most places in Canada. You know what you need are Canadian dollars. So when you cross the border, you're given the opportunity to convert your money from U.S. dollars into Canadian dollars. This is money changing from one currency to another currency. So lots of economics involved in this lesson today. Uh, and what happens is the people who do this will charge a fee for the work they are doing. Now, this is work, and there's nothing wrong with charging a fee for the work that you do as long as it's not exploitation, right? So th this is a concept that's very clear in the Old Testament that uh, you, know, you don't charge uh, usury for things that 
you, and it's just, I don't want to get into all that, but there's a, there's a limit to which reasonableness occurs here. So we change our money. We can go conduct business, economic business in another country from doing that. Then we come, when we come back into our country, what we need to do is we need to convert those Canadian dollars back into U.S. dollars. All right, so here we go. So in Jesus' day, economies were even shockingly more complex than they are now because the United States has one currency. Canada has one currency. Mexico has one currency. It's very straightforward, very simple. The more uh, third world you get, the more varieties of currencies you can have within an individual country. Uh, one, I, I studied this just a little bit, but a fascinating history uh, lesson is actually the study of currency in the United States. Uh, because originally, we used what the British used because we were British colonists at that point. And then there would be currencies that popped up. So New York had a currency and Georgia had a currency and South Carolina had a currency and all these different colonies had currency. I don't know if Georgia was a colony. I'm not a history major, but just picking states here. But you had to convert between one colony's currency to another. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. And actually one of the really big deals that made America, America was standardization of currency. So going back to Jesus time here. So the money changers. So this is the time of Passover. This is the time also when once a year Jews had to pay the temple tax and the temple tax had to be paid in a very specific currency because the priests received funding in one specific type of currency. Now, the Hebrew shekel is what the Old Testament mandated. The uh, <laughs> What a quote, Barry. What a quote. Uh, I miss having you physically in class because I don't know how I would have come back from that. Uh, so the, the Hebrew shekel was what was mandated in the Old Testament. They didn't use the Hebrew shekel here. They used something slightly different. It was really close to the Hebrew shekel. So I'm going to read one of my resources and uh, kind of walk you through what this looked like. So this is um, Mark's, this is from the Baker Exegetical Commentary on the New Testament. This is Robert Stein. Uh, it's a very good resource for historical things that wouldn't come naturally to a 21st century believer. So uh, integral to the worship, this is on page 515. Integral to the worship carried on in the temple were offerings of sacrifices and the once a year collection of the temple tax. So if you remember, this is what Mary and Joseph had to go to Jerusalem for to pay the temple tax, right? In the story of Jesus' birth. Uh, so the temple tax, this half shekel was collected from each Jewish male who was 20 years of age or older. So there's references to Exodus and Nehemiah and uh, Josephus of Antiquities and his whatnot. So payment had to be used using the Tyrian silver half shekel. I know you were all riveted about that, right? So to facilitate this money changing, tables were set up in the provinces a couple of weeks earlier. And then uh, on the 25th of Adar, this is the month before Nisan, the, where the Passover occurs, they were set up in the court of the Gentiles so that the tax could be paid by the 1st of Nisan. This was the, the due date, if you will. Uh, all this, of course, and this is probably my favorite one-liner in all the commentaries I have read on, <laughs> on Mark so far. All this, of course, did not take place on a nonprofit basis. <laughs> it's a really good... The commentators are funny sometimes, but they don't like have emojis that they tell you when they're telling a joke. All right, and the exchange of monies involved a charge of about 4 to 8%. So to facilitate the offering of blemish-free sacrifices, because you didn't want to offer a sacrifice that had a blemish, certified or approved sacrifices were sold year-round in the court of the Gentiles within the temple itself. And this was a very profitable venture. Um, the priests actually controlled the, all of the economics inside the temple. They were in charge of that. Even though this is under Roman rule, the, the priests controlled these, the, the minor economy here. And they were very criticized in these Old Testament Jewish writings for a couple of things. One, it was not economically fair to the poor. And two, the priests were getting rich. So when you think about who Jesus is talking about all the way through the Gospels and their actions and their activities, everybody knew they were getting financially exploited at the temple once a year. And that the priests had their hand in it and the priests were getting rich doing it. Everybody knew this. This is what they did. So when Jesus calls out the religious elite, the religious leaders, everybody knew what they were up to. This was not a secret, right? 
So, so this is the, the background in the context of kind of what's going on right here. All right, so, so Jesus uh, catastrophes the tables of the money changers and uh, the seats of those who sold pigeons. And you're like, pigeons? Like, what's, what's this got to do with Barry's comment, right? All right. So this word is also used earlier in Mark's gospel in Mark 1, 10. So flip back over to Mark chapter 1, verse 10. It's not as easy to tell that it's the same word, but it's the same word. So verse 9, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. So dove and pigeon are interchangeable here in Mark's gospel. It's the same Greek word. So they were selling pigeons. Now, what are they selling pigeons for? You're like, oh my goodness. All right. Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 5 and give us some, shed some light on what's going on here in Mark chapter 11. So Leviticus chapter 5. Some of you are like, Leviticus, oh no. Yeah, it's good stuff. Leviticus chapter 5. And we can actually just kind of actually start with verse. Um, let's start with the end of verse 6. So this is talking about uh, we're in the middle of the, the sections that talk about uh, laws for sin offerings that begin in chapter 4. Uh, at the end of verse 6, it says in chapter 5, And the priest shall make atonement for him for sin. Right? So the priest is doing something with the sacrifices that are being brought. Verse 7, But if he cannot afford a lamb, this is the person who has sinned, that he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. So who bought the pigeons? If he cannot afford a lamb, the poor. The poor bought the pigeons. What is Jesus doing here? He overturned the money changers, the tables of the money changers, and the seats of those who sold pigeons. These people were oppressing the poor in their desire to be obedient to the Scripture, in their desire to worship the Lord, in their desire to fulfill what God had commanded them to do. They were oppressing the poor. It is what it is. This is what Jesus is revolting against here. Revolt may be the wrong word, but you get the idea. Verse 16. This is a curious little verse. And he would not allow, uh, this is an imperfect, so this is action continually, repeatedly happening in the past. He would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And you're like, what, what's that about? Well, how do you think they got all of their merchandise in and out? Right? These are the folks that are engaged in this. We, we bring in money. We send out money. We bring in animals. We send out dead animals. This is, the, this is the, the transactional piece of what verse 15, the people in verse 15 are doing. Uh, you know, the temple's not a big box store. It's, it's, a, it's a big box, but it's not a big box store. And they had taken this idea of you come here to worship God, to allow the priest to atone for sin, to point toward the one who will ultimately atone for all sin. And they turned it into an economic transaction. And Jesus says, that's not what this is about. Not what this is about all, at all. So he wouldn't let anyone carry anything through the temple. Verse 17, and he was teaching them. Now, this is an imperfect tense as well for the teaching word here. So even as Jesus is judging those, because that's what this is, this is judgment, this is why the fig tree is before and the fig tree is after. Mark is sending us a message with the order in which he has arranged things in his gospel, that this is all about judgments, what's going on here. Uh, as he was teaching them, this is a repeated action, and saying another imperfect. So he, he is saying this over and over and over again. If, if you've ever wondered, like, what was Jesus saying while he was doing this? while he was flipping over tables and prohibiting people from doing things in this 35-acre area, right? What was he saying? Well, here's what he was saying. Is it not written? I love this man. 
He's pointing them back to the scripture, right? He's absolutely pointing them back to the scripture. And this is where he's going to start quoting from. He's going to start quoting from Isaiah 56 and Jeremiah 7. We're going to read those in just a minute. So is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? You're like, what? Yes. So Jen, what were they doing coming to the temple? It's a place of prayer for all the nations. I love it when Jesus answers our questions, right? Let's go to Isaiah 56. I'll show you the larger section here. Isaiah 56. Isaiah is almost in the dead center of your Bible. so We'll start with verse 1, and we'll kind of lead up to the section where Jesus quotes here. So thus says the Lord, keep justice, do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my righteousness be revealed. This is hundreds of years before Jesus, but it's coming. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Be, be part of a family that you can't have. Verse 6, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord... The foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, the Gentiles who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, this is what they're doing there, and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. What a generous invitation. The Father is saying here, whosoever will. If you want to come and be part of this family, you can through sacrifice. These burnt offerings that pointed toward Christ's ultimate sacrifice, right? Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar from my house, shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. It's beautiful. It's like, come in, come in. I want the family to grow. So this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And they are exploiting the Gentiles' ability to commune and pray and worship God. This is a problem for Jesus, and I hope it is a problem for us because there are no walls that we put up for people who want to worship God. It's not the way this should work. So he doesn't stop there, though. But you have made it a den of robbers. So he takes a snippet from Isaiah, and he takes a snippet from Jeremiah. So Jeremiah is chapter 7, just a couple pages over. Jeremiah 7. This is, uh, we'll start with verse 1 in Jeremiah chapter 7. And the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord and the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. I think he's serious. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice with one, one with another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, it's the person who's traveling in your land, these would be Gentiles. If you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered? Only to go on doing all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Whoa. 
So what has Jesus done in Mark chapter 11? He showed up the day before to see it. And what do rabbis do when they quote a piece of scripture? They're actually talking about the piece of scripture they quote and the next sentence too. Jesus has got a head nod here declaring that he is the Lord and he has seen it and he is here to fix it. God help the man or woman who stands in the way of one who desires to worship the Lord because God takes this seriously and I think we should too. So you have made it a den of robbers. Verse 18, and the chief priests and the scribes heard it. Now we'll talk a lot more about chief priests in the next couple of weeks. Uh, give you some context as to what that is. But these chief priests and the scribes heard it. They heard Jesus quoting these words and they knew what this was about. They knew exactly what this was about. They knew he was talking about them and that they were the ones who had turned the house of the Lord into a den of robbers. This would not have sat well with them, right? The chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking, this is imperfect, this is repeated action, a way to destroy him for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Of course they feared him. They feared him just like they've been fearing him the entire time in Mark, right? He's a threat to their money-making empire. So what do you do with threats to your money-making empire? You put them down. Or so they thought. <laughs> they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And we see this back in Mark chapter 1, that it was normal for people to be astonished at Jesus' teaching. So this is just him continuing on Jesus being Jesus. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. He is the one who has the authority to walk into the temple and cleanse it. Because he is the flawless sacrifice. It's beautiful. Verse 19, and when evening had come, they went out of the city. Work's done. Let's go back to Bethany. It's amazing stuff. All right, so a couple of things here, a couple of applications and personalizations. Uh, there there would be, could be dozens and dozens and dozens of applications and personalizations with this text, but just a few here. So Jesus, uh, application number one, Jesus is the perfect judge. He declares, he inspects, and then he, ju he judges. He's the perfect judge. He declares, he inspects, and he judges. So what do we do with that? We better know what he's declared. We better obey, right? Because inspection is coming, and we better submit to his judgments. When we see Jesus judge things, we should say that is good and right and holy. And what he has done in Mark chapter 11 is good and right and holy. It is not an aberration. It is not him flying off the handle. It is not him being sinfully angry. It is not him being in the flesh. It is good. It is right. It is holy. And he is our example in this. And God help us if we miss what he is doing. So application number two, Jesus is always teaching. In the middle of all this, he is teaching. That is the word Mark chose to use. <laughs> it's incredible. He never stops teaching. It's unbelievable. As somebody who wears the moniker teacher from time to time, I, I cannot imagine always being on like he is. And he's always on and he's always perfect. So what do we do with that? I would say repent and believe in his gospel. Where we do not align with his wise and holy will, repent of that and believe in the gospel anew and align ourselves with what Jesus Christ is teaching. And then application number three, uh, barriers to worship will be judged catastrophically. I can't say it any clearer than that. So what do we do with that? Open wide the doors. Invite everybody in. Make the barrier nothing. Whatever it is that we are doing that hinder others from worshiping God, we should stop. And I think this passage calls us to stop and pause and reflect and evaluate what are we doing that is hindering anybody else from worshiping God. So maybe this week we spend a little bit of time thinking about that. Maybe this week we spend a little bit of time thanking God for the opportunities he's given us. Maybe this week we spend a little bit of time reflecting on how are we putting up walls? How are we forcing others to change out money? How are we forcing others to pay more for pigeons than they should? Because God help us if we're doing these things. So I'll leave you with uh, one quote. This is from 
the Gospel According to Mark. This is Edwards from the Pillar New Testament Commentary. Um, I generally don't read this many commentaries during the week, but I had a lot of work to do on the, the temple tax and the temple and all those details. But I came across this, and this was just, this is beautiful, because this is us. The Messiah was popularly expected to purge Jerusalem and the temple of Gentiles, aliens, and foreigners. This is who they thought they were getting, right? Jesus' action, however, is exactly the reverse. He does not clear the temple of Gentiles, but for them. This is our Jesus. This is the one who laid down his life for us, and I hope you know him. So we'll move into a time of prayer. I would encourage you, if you have any prayer requests, to write those down, to engage, to pray for each other, pray for somebody that's not with us right now. I know I've gone just a minute long, but I wanted to get this in today and have it be a complete lesson. Appreciate your patience here. Um, so if you've got prayer requests that are on your heart, please uh, list those so that we can be praying for them. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll start with Mark 11, 20. Don't forget about our homework to pray, hear, think, talk, share, and invite. We've got tons of resources at OurSundaySchool.com. Go there, grab those. But don't forget to spend some time this week in reflection and, for me, repentance around any barriers that we have put up for worship for those that desire to worship our Messiah. So, love you guys, and I miss you, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks for engaging, and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, YouTube channel, and weekly email. You can subscribe to all three of those at OurSundaySchool.com. Grace and peace to you.